Well, it's a couple minutes past seven, and I'm sure we'll have a few more people join us here in a few minutes, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm Stephanie McCulley, and I am the Grant County Extension Educator for a and &R, and uh, our Area 8 team is really excited to put this on for you. And tonight we have Joe Rorick with CCSI, and he's going to dive into some cover crops, timings, especially with um, what could be a... a little bit sooner harvest this year and things like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and let him get rolling. Um, like Adam mentioned, at the end, we will have all the CEU and CCH numbers at the end, so you can get um, those written down. So if you guys do have any questions, uh, feel free to type them in the chat box and we'll make sure that we get those answered for you. Perfect, thanks, Stephanie. Um, like you said, my name is Joe Rorick and I'm the agronomist for the Conservation Cropping Systems Initiative. Um, and and Stephanie, sincerely thank you for not promising too much for what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. I promise you I am going to do my best to not show you a bunch of slides because I don't want to show you a bunch of slides. So. Um, you'll see my name here talking as a demo cam. I'm going to try to do a live demonstration and you will see we'll do that here in a little bit, but I do have a couple of slides to start with if I can find where the screen share went. There we go. Hang on. Sorry folks. I'm I will be honest with you. I am an agronomist. I am not a tech person. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some key management considerations for cover crops. Um, like I said, my name's Joe Rorick. Um, I am a certified crop advisor. I am a 4R nutrient management specialist as well as a sustainability specialist. Um, if you've never heard of CTSI, um, I'm gonna to try to show the website a little bit later, but um, there's all of our contact info. There's our website, ccsin.org. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, although now that I look at that, I think we actually have a different Facebook name. I think it's um, Indiana Soils. But uh, we're on Instagram and we are on Flickr. We have a photo database with some good side-by-side um, -side comparisons and things. So, um, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Please feel free if you have any questions as we're getting, into, getting into these things. Um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, drop them in the chat box. Um, I don't know if you're able to unmute yourself or, or not, but um, if you can unmute, unmute yourself, um, let's talk about things. But um, so our mission, CCSI's mission is to improve soil health on Indiana cropland. We are a project of the Indiana, Indiana Conservation Partnership. Um, and these are all the, the formal partners of, of that partnership. Um, I am actually a, a Purdue employee. Other members of our CCSI team are with um, the Indiana Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts. Um, of course, that does not limit us to who we work with. We have a ton of partners all over the state. This is not all inclusive, um, but just to give you an idea of, of the sorts of folks we work with. Um, and then I, I just quickly, I always like to, to talk about what soil health is. So this is the NRCS definition, uh, and it's it's a it's a good definition. So that's what I like to work with. Um, it's the continued capacity of a soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. And what I really want to highlight there is that it's the continued capacity of a soil and that it's a function, right? These soils should function. And that is something that we have lost a little bit of in some of our soils in moving away from conservation cropping systems and moving away from, from soil health practices. Um, we have lost some of that function. So I want to take some time now to show you what some of that function is. I'm going to stop my video here. And Stephanie, if you can, 
I'll start my video over on my demonstration camera. So what we have here are, are two soils and these are actually, um, these are Miami soils. These are our state soil series. Um, Indiana State Soil Series is, my, is the Miami series. So if you learn nothing from today, which I hope that's not the case, but at least now you know that Indiana has a state soil series and it is these, it's the Miami series. Um, so these are pretty typical silt loam soils that we have over a good portion of the state. On the left, um, these are soils, I actually took these from Miami County. Um, on the left is multiple tillage passes with no cover crops, right? So these are, are um, both spring and fall tillage passes and, and no cover crops in that system. On the right hand side is uh, long-term no-till with cover crops as well. Um, probably 15 or 20 years of cover crops in this instance and um, some pretty diverse cover crops. However, some of the functions we are going to talk about do not rely on long-term cover crops. Some of the things we're gonna talk about um, happen pretty quickly it, with the introduction of of a cover crop. Um, so, and I also am gonna promise you guys, I'm not gonna move this around a lot, but I wanna show you these soils. So over here, this is, our, this is our tillage system. And if you look at that soil, it is, it's really fine. There's, there's very little structure left in it. Um, all the pores are closed and um, there's no obvious signs of, of roots or earthworm channels or, or habitat for biology, um, anything like that. If you look over here at our soil health management system, you can see the biopores in there. You can see that granular, may, maybe even subangular blocky structure. Do we have any soil scientists on tonight? Hopefully not, they'll call me on that. But it's, it's probably granular structure, it's probably not subangular blocky. Um, but you can, the point is you can see that structure, right? Um, I have a clod up here, a ped up here, that you can still see those roots coming through it and a little bit of a crown of a plant um, holding everything together there. And then if you look at this clod, which actually is a clod. Um, this is from the surface. You can see that crust that has formed there um, and, and that platy structure here. And that's a bad thing, right? Um, so we're gonna take these soils and a lot of you have, have probably seen these slake tubes. Um, I do have to apologize to you, the water, I'm, I'm, I came on campus for a better internet connection, um, but the building hasn't been used pretty well all summer. Um, so this water is kind of rusty. And if you think it doesn't look bad for demonstrations, I can assure you that it makes terrible coffee. Um, but anyway, there's, there's nothing in the water, it's just rusty um, from sitting all summer because we haven't had enough people in the building to use it. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and take two of these soils and we're gonna drop them into the water. Remember on the left is heavy tillage, no cover crops. On the right is no till and cover crops. And we're gonna just take and drop them in the water and see what happens. So right away, what you can see there is that that soil on the left, because it has no aggregate stability, because it has been tilled into submission, it has no structure to hold itself together anymore. Um, there is the, the, the biological life in that soil is not able to create enough enzymes to help bind those soil particles together. And you're watching that soil slough off from that ped and cloud up the water. 
right, and fall to the bottom. On the right hand side, from that soil health management system, you can see that that soil is holding together, right? We talk about that in terms of aggregate stability. So those soil aggregates, um, those soil particles are bound to each other and, and then that makes a micro aggregate. And then micro aggregates bind to each other to make macro aggregates, right? Which creates a little home that, that is able to hold water, it's able to hold nutrients, it's able to provide uh, uh, um, some water films and things for the microbiology to live in. Um, fungal hyphae tend to uh, bind micro aggregates together. Uh, roots bind things together, right? So that soil is able to hold together in the presence of water, right? And on the left, that soil is falling apart with just a little bit of water. These soils are just air dried. Um, I had collected these last fall and air dried them for the sake of storage. Um, but you have to think, right, all of that water that's clouded with that soil, this is just a tube, right? It's held in there by the walls of the tube. But if those walls were missing, how often do we have two feet of water standing on a field? Um, probably, I mean, some of you would probably say more often than you'd like, if it ever happens, um, it's, that's more often than you would like, certainly. Uh, but the point is that water is gonna move, right? And anything that's in that water it's gonna move with it. And you have to remember folks that this is our, our topsoil that we're losing, right? This is our most valuable resource on the landscape is our topsoil because that's where our organic matter is. That's where the nutrients that you apply are bound to. That's where the herbicides that you apply are bound to. Um, all kinds of things. That's where a lot of your um, cation exchange capacity comes from is that organic matter as, as well as the clay. But if you lose that topsoil, you lose a lot of the productivity of your land. On the right here, where that soil is able to hold together, that tube is still as clear as it was without that water being rusty. Um, because that soil is able to hold together. And you can see the soil piling up here at the bottom. So I'm going to move these out of the way now and we're going to run another test. And this is a test that I would encourage all of you to try on your own. So this is what we call our slump test. And what I have are just um, sink strainers or, or, or bathtub strainers. They're just a, a wire mesh screen um, and it never fails. I call them a sink strainer and somebody says, well, that's the bathtub size. Um, but there's a big size, there's a small size. Anyway, they're, they're cheap. They're like a dollar or two. You can buy packs of them. That's what we do. Um, but you take this soil and you crumble it up and you put it into that strainer. And you want that soil to be pretty well crumbled. You don't want it totally mashed into powder, but you want it to be uh, broken down into its natural, um, just how it naturally wants to break up into its into its uh, aggregates and, and, and substructure, right? So once you have your, your sieve or your screen filled up, you just take that, you take a cup of water or a jar of water or whatever, and you drop it in there. And this test is not meant to act like that slake in those big tubes, but you can see right away, even through that really fine wire mesh, right? This is just like a window screen mesh, that that soil is breaking down far enough that it's able to go through that fine screen. Right, so 
that's the size of particle that's going to stay in suspension that's going to be lost from a field, right? Or worse yet, if it isn't lost from the field, it collects at a low spot, and that's how you end up with a soil crust, right? And all of those fine particles lock together, and for a seedling to try to come through there to break through that crust is difficult, right? So that's how you start. Those are those are some of the things that you start losing yield to, is is how you get rid of some of these, is how you break up that crust. Of course, a soil with no structure makes a very fine seed bed, right? And that's one of the reasons why you might do tillage is to make a very fine seed bed. And that soil certainly does make a very fine seed bed. Um, however, look at the color difference between these two soils. We know that organic matter gives us a good portion of that dark color. You can see clearly that this soil from our soil health management system probably has a lot more organic matter than this one does here. And you have to remember these are both Miami soils. The only difference between these two is management. So they have managed to get rid of most of the organic matter in this soil. And in this one, they are able to either maintain it or maybe even in fact build organic matter some. So these are just styrofoam plates that I'm putting on here. Um, and what you wanna do then after these soils have soaked up is lift them up, let the water drain off. You can see that water is, is still quite cloudy on the left hand side, on the right hand side, still pretty clear. Those aggregates are remaining intact. You take those sieves and you pour those soils out onto a plate or a shovel or a tailgate, doesn't matter what, and you look at those. On the left hand side here, like we talked about, there's no aggregates left, right? This is just this is just mud. There's there's no structure left. There's no aggregate stability left. On the right hand side, you can see all of those aggregates still intact here. And if you tip the plate, you can see it's holding on to the water that was that it was. Over here, sometimes you'll have enough excess water that, that water will in fact run off of that. But if you drag your finger through here, you're still seeing those aggregates fall apart, right? Because they're, they're able to withstand that water and those glues, those biological glues are able to hold that soil together. Um, I would encourage all of you to try this at home. Try this with your own soils and see which one they look like. Does it turn to mud? or is it able to hold up, right? Um, you want to take soils from that top probably two inches, that, that near surface, that's where we're the most concerned with aggregate stability. Because if you think as a raindrop hits the soil, if there isn't a plant or a piece of residue or something to break that raindrop impact, all you have is that soil and those aggregates to break that impact of that raindrop. So you want to make sure that that aggregate is strong enough to be able to allow that raindrop to infiltrate into the soil, right? But if you don't have, don't have any aggregate stability, if you have a soil crust, then that raindrop can't infiltrate, right? So that's one of the reasons why we're worried about aggregate stability in that near surface. Also think about this in terms of trafficability, right? Which one of these soils am I going to be able to get a combine on in a wet October? Which one of these soils am I going to be able to get a planter on if things just, if we get a spring that's a little weird and, and just doesn't quite work out the way that we want it to, right? So aggregate, aggregate stability factors into trafficability as well. Um, so these are all important things to consider when you're thinking about that. Um, and if I move these water cups back out of the way and we check in on 
our slate tubes. You can see that that soil pad has continued to degrade. And as I move it, and even as I shake them, right, that soil just totally falls apart, right? And even here, where I'm able to get some of those soil aggregates to fall apart, those aggregates are holding together as they fall down the tube. You can see that water's not clouding up, right? So, so those are all indicators of soil function that I would encourage all of you to, to go and look for. Um, so do I have any questions? on those while I transition back to the computer. I hope you're looking pretty clear, Joe. Thanks, Jeff. Um, um, could I, I guess for the no-till, do you know what kind of um, I, you'll probably get into this, but like, what were they using if it's a 20 year program? Can you give a quick overview of what plants they were putting down for cover crops? Yeah. Um, so they, it's, it's hard telling with some of these folks that have been doing it for a long, long time. Um, a lot, a lot started with annual ryegrass back then. Um, or even just radish alone, um, those are not necessarily things that we recommend starting with at this point. And we don't recommend radish alone at all. Um, there's a brand of radish called a, a, a tillage radish. And, and in fact, it, it, it often can mimic tillage um, and leave that soil quite friable and loose. So a radish alone, you don't necessarily want that. Um, especially if one of your goals of using that cover crop is to help fight erosion and protect your soil. So, so you don't want that radish alone. Um, we will talk a little bit about, actually that's a good, that's the perfect segue, Jeff. So thank you for that. Um, we'll go ahead and talk about um, stepping into a system what that looks like for a corn and soybean rotation. Um, but first I would like to show you a couple of things here. So this is just a visual representation of what we just saw. Um, this isn't taken from the actual field. This is, these are some plots that we had down at the Southeast Purdue Ag Center. Um, and this was just incidental. This was a cereal rye cover crop trial. Um, all good no-till with and without cereal rye. So at the top of the picture, you can see that there is a road. Well, you can get the impression there's a road. You can't see the road. Um, but you can see that the water collects there and runs through this little wash and across the field here. And you can see to the line where that last drilled row of cereal rye was, due to the aggregate stability differences in this field. So this is after, at this point, this is after four years of a cover crop and of, of this zero rye cover crop, it was drilled at, at about 60 pounds um, to the acre, I think of, of total seed, not pure live seed. Um, so kind of a moderate um, seeding rate, but um, just due to the forces of that water washing over that field, um, you can see that down here at the bottom where that root is not growing, that soil is not protected enough and it has started to wash away. But where there are those roots growing over the winter when the crops have been harvested, um, that even that little root, right? That cereal rye is only three inches tall here maybe. Um, this is taken in about March or so. That cereal rye is not that big, 
Um, and so those, those roots are also kind of little, and, but those roots have been pumping sugars back into the soil the whole winter. And, and for several years now, there's been a living root in that soil throughout as much of the year as possible, right? So, so this is why we care about aggregate stability. Um, if you have places where water will wash through a field. Incidentally, if you don't want to put a cover crop on every acre that you farm, um, this is a great place to start with a cover crop. You can do a seasonal grassed waterway with some of these cover crops to help fight some of the erosion, some of this ephemeral erosion or these gullies, eventually these gullies that, that form in these fields with a seasonal grassed waterway, right? Um, so let me skip ahead here to um, some recipes. As I promised you guys that I wouldn't show you a bunch of slides, but if the technology didn't work, I wanted to um, have some slides as a backup just in case. Okay, so go ahead. Sorry, folks. There we go. Except this is back the same one. All right, bear with me here. So this is everybody's favorite cover crop, right? On the left-hand side, everybody says, well, I grow a cover crop, I have weeds. Well, that's, that's not really what we're talking about with cover crops. What we want is on the right-hand side, you can see that's a nice, even, thick stand. Uh, in this case, it's zero rye. You can get a better idea of what is out there. You can get a better idea of how to manage that, right? You know how those are gonna act. All these different weed species are all gonna act differently. Um, they're going to go to seed at different times. They're going to mature at different times. Um, they may be um, harboring pest species. They might be hosts or alternate hosts for pest species. Um, so you don't really want to have things out there that you don't know how to manage properly, right? And that's important when you're thinking about a cover crop here. Um, So okay, here's another aggregate stability um, example, right? On the left hand side, you would look at that picture and you might not think that there's an erosion problem there. But in fact, in this example here, this is um, uh, a handful of percent of slope, I, I, it's less than six, but I don't remember exactly how much slope it is. Um, due to the way the study was set up, they planted up and down the rows, and, and that may or may not be a thing that you do. Um, and, and for central Indiana, you guys may not even have a couple of percent of slope <laughs> over some of your fields. Um, but certainly there are areas that do have that. Um, but, and you might look at this and say, well, there's no erosion there. Um, but in this instance, there was enough erosion that you can see those seed slots and it washed the soil out of that seed slot and it washed the seed out of that seed slot and then it also washed the starter fertilizer out of that seed slot probably as well, right? So even though you might look at this picture and say, well, there's, there's not an erosion problem in that field, um, depending on what your numbers are for what it costs you um, to plant an acre of corn and to put down starter fertilizer for an acre of corn, um, you might really consider that a problem, even if it doesn't look like a problem, right? Um, on the right-hand side where we've got that rye residue, um, this has been chemically terminated, 
where you have that zero rye residue, uh, you can you can see that that there's no soil even visible, um, let alone able to wash away, right? Because it's those roots have been growing, they've been building aggregates, the the soil is able to hold together. Um, that residue is acting as a physical blanket as well, sitting over that soil surface and um, protecting that soil from that raindrop impact. So at this point, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, some good resources. So the Midwest Cover Crops Council is a fantastic resource. Um, Eileen Kladivko here at Purdue is one of the one of the best one of the founding members of the Midwest Cover Crops Council. Um, probably one of the best cover crop researchers out there. Um, I did my master's with her. I'm, I'm very, very partial, uh, very biased towards Eileen. Um, and she has spoken at this in years past. So you may have heard her. Um, at any rate, if you go to the Midwest Cover Crops Council website, um, they have recipes on their website, right? So if you go to the Getting Started tab, you can see that they have cover crop recipes. If you click on those, they have them by state. Um, and province, there are some of the Canadian provinces that are part of the Midwest Cover Crops Council. Um, so if you click Indiana, um, these are just some simple, easy recipes for a corn and soybean rotation, which is predominantly um, one of, that's, that's our predominant cropping system, right? Corn and soybean rotation. Um, they are downloadable as a PDF. A lot of you have probably heard me give a talk on stepping into a system before, um, and, and this just is based, the, that talk is based off of this recipe, right? So um, post corn, before soybeans, where we recommend you start with a cover crop, use zero rye, right? So it, it talks about making sure you do your homework, um, making sure you don't have a bunch of um, residual herbicides out there that's gonna keep that cover crop from popping up. You want to make sure you get good seed on time. Um, if you're gonna do things in the fall, uh, make sure you do it before you're planting, right? Um, if you need to do a burn down, et cetera, check that. Make sure your fertility is good. Um, it just walks you through some of the, the nitty gritty details of how to step in to integrating a cover crop into your corn and soybean rotation, right? Um, if you go and look at post soybean going to corn, right? You want to make it. You want to um, use oats and radish, right? That's a simple one. They will winter kill, and um, you will not have to worry as much about managing that cover crop in the spring like oftentimes you do with cereal rye. Um, cereal rye can grow really fast in the spring. It can get away from you. Um, it can also tie up a lot of nitrogen in that residue and in that growing plant biomass. So if you're going to be planting corn into cereal rye, um, those are all considerations that you need to think about um, and they, they can be an issue. You can get some nitrogen tie-up issues. You can get some, um, folks all often refer to it as, as allelopathy um, from that cereal rye, although allelopathy is, is kind of a, a, a finicky thing to track down um, and, and replicate. Um, but at any rate, if you're just getting into this or if you want a simple, easy way, um, use oats and radish before corn. Um, and especially this year, if you're going to have a little bit of an early harvest, um, especially if you have some soybeans that you're going to harvest early, go ahead and plant some oat and radish in that field um, because you want them planted early um, because these oats and radish will winter kill. If you're looking Another great resource on this Midwest Cover Crops Council website is selector tools. So here at the top, I went to the selector tool tab, um, and you want to go to the row crop tool. So you click on the row crop tool, 
and it takes you to this page and this is one of the um, pages from the very early days of the Midwest Cover Crops Council. So it's not um, the best, the nicest, cleanest looking thing, but it's it's super functional. Um, and I'm actually grateful that we're able to do this virtually today. Um, oftentimes, this is tried. You, you have to try to do this in a um, just in a regular PowerPoint format, in in the and everybody's sitting in the back of the room because nobody likes to sit in the front row and um, it makes for a terrible presentation, in my opinion. Uh, it's very difficult to present. It's very difficult to actually see. So I'm grateful that we're able to do this virtually, and, and hopefully you guys are able to see this a little bit better. So what you want to do, first thing, is select your state, right? So this is a Central Indiana Field Day. We're in Indiana. We're going to select Indiana. Um, we're going to select, um, well, Stephanie, you're in, you're in Grant County. So let's go with Grant County. I have the cash crop in as none or prevented planting because I want to show you the full gamut here of what the options are. So you can see these green bars here across the top. There are dates um, at, the, at the top of the month and the middle of the month. And you look down the lines here so if we go to oats you go here and you got a pretty reliable seeding window for spring oats from april 1st to september 15th here in grant county um, if you go down here and you look at radish you know a, a, a daikon type or even a forage type radish a winter kill radish um, you can see that seeding window is quite smaller, quite a bit smaller. Um, and here we have these yellow bars, and that means there's a, a freeze risk to establishment. I did talk to our state, state climatologist. Um, I wanted to see if maybe there was any indication whatsoever of what kind of a fall we were going to have. And um, no such luck, of course. That's just how that sort of thing goes. Um, so these run on the 30 year averages and um, in general, in Grant County, um, you want to have that radish seeded ideally by September 15th. And um, depending on what kind of fall is gonna be and um, depending on what, how, how much risk you're willing to take, right? Farmers, you guys are, are, are just you are that's what you do is is risk management right so um however much risk you're willing to take here um if you're going to plant a radish or you're going to plant uh, a spring oat you want to make sure by september 15th those are planted so that there's enough growing degree days there's enough heat unit accumulation to grow to get some good out of those before they would winter kill um, you know, at that average first hard frost, which is probably somewhere in here in this October, November range. Um, we talked about cereal rye. Um, and cereal rye, winter cereal rye here, is is a powerhouse cover crop. And, and you can see that they, they're okay saying you can plant this well into November, right? Um, and then now here there's a red bar introduction. And that red bar is a frost seeding option. Um, so you could even throw this out onto frozen ground and let that freeze thaw into the ground. Or if it hasn't quite frozen up, there's only a little bit of a crust that you can break with a, a drill, but still enough of a crust to hold the equipment up. Um, you can even drill into the winter um, and, and cereal rye just kind of tends to come up still, right? Of course, with cereal rye, you absolutely want to consider uh, your termination methods, um, but you know, the, these are things that you can play with here. Um, if you are looking at this fall, 
you can put in your harvest date. Um, so let's say we're gonna harvest on September 1. Um, and we are going to um, say that these are uh, moderately well-drained soils, the, the drainage class can factor in. Um, let's say you planted, um, it was a pretty good spring, let's say you got in there April 8th and you want to harvest September 1st, right? So you can see here it put this blue box over when you have a crop in the field. Right, so that's when your crop is growing. You can see here that that might cut out some of your cover crop options, like your summer annual grasses, like sorghum Sudan grass and, and Sudan grass, um, as well as uh, your summer legumes, like a cow pea, right? Um, so if you have wheat in your rotation and you were to um, harvest that, in the beginning of July, it would move that blue box over and that would open up a lot bigger window for cover crops, right? So you harvest July 8th um, and ignore that plant date, you know, that plant date would be the previous fall likely. Um, you can see that opens up a lot of windows, right? So I would encourage all of you to check out this, this selector tool if you're looking at, at cover crop options because it's pretty cool. Um, as far as what it gives you. It has some some rough mixes down here at the bottom that you can look through um, to give you an idea like um, like a hairy vetch with zero rye. If you're if you're used to growing zero rye and you want to mix in some hairy vetch uh, like a legume to get a little bit of nitrogen production that can work. Um, here's our oat radish mix here at the very bottom. Right. Um, so I would encourage all of you to play with that. If you go through and you select what you want your goals of that cover crop to be. Um, so for example, if we want really quick growth, um, then it gives us numbers here. It gives us a rating. Zero is low and, and four is high, right? Four is excellent, zero is poor. Um, so for quick growth, here's our options, right? Um, sorghum sedan grass is a quick grower, but that's a, a summer annual and it will winter kill. So that may not be a great option if you are doing a corn and soybean rotation. Um, spring oats grow really fast in the fall. Those also winter kill though. So you wanna make sure that you're gonna plant it here in this green bar window so that it has enough time to get some growth in order to do you some good. You can stack your goals and it will give you ratings for each um, and, and you can go through and you can see it starts to gray out some things if they aren't good for those, right? So it has to be um, a three or higher or a, 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 a a, a three or two or higher in order to, to meet those goals. So you can see it starts to gray those out. Um, remember we talked about radishes loosening the soil. So as an erosion fighter, a radish is not a great, a, a great cover crop. Um, but a lot of our grasses are great erosion fighters. Um, and a lot of our grasses also have quick growth. Um, so I would really encourage you guys to play with that. Um, because it, it is a nice, uh, a really nice tool for looking at cover crop options um, and it's free, right? So you don't even have to pay. <laughs> you don't have to buy the seed and plant them um, in order to try those. Uh, in the central Indiana area, there are uh, along the upper white watershed, um, there is a cover crop program. Um, and these are, this is from, um, there's a whole group involved. It's, it's um, Indiana Soybean Alliance and the Corn Marketing Council. And um, I think the, well, the, the Indiana Ag Nutrient Alliance and um, I think maybe Bex Hybrids and, and, and Cargill and some folks. Um, 
so they have some uh, they have a program for cover crops um, and if you visit the web page you can just google um, the upper white watershed cover crop program um, to find this or, or here's the web page you can find this and it, and it gives you the details for that I think registration is closed for this year um, but uh, I think they're continuing to do that of course um, call your local NRCS office call your local USDA service center um, they have cost share available for cover crops if and even if they don't even if you don't want their cost share dollars they're willing to talk through a conservation plan with you uh, and and how to implement that on your farm um, depending on your area there might even be some local cost share dollars whether that's through uh, clean water Indiana funds or, or some other sources um, so Call your soil and water conservation district, call your NRCS office, um, talk to your corn board, sort, corn board soy board reps. Um, they might have programs. Um, of course, you can talk to your extension office. Uh, almost all your educators are on here, it looks like, based on a quick glance through the um, participants screen. Um, and I would just end with our own website, right? Um, ccsin.org um, feel free our contact information is here on the website um, under the contact tab um, we have a, a, a so health campaign love and soil we've got billboards around the state and a hashtag um, under the do tab we have an event calendar that has all of the soil health events of, that we know about going on around the state um, on there so if you're looking for things go ahead and check those out um, we have information about us and um, we've had a podcast series for three or so years now two and a half years with um, who's your act today uh, that's really great we have both a um, regular row crops track for that and then we've also now this year we've added a specialty crops podcast series um, in addition to that so you can see these, this first one here is about cover crops and sweet corn right so how can you work some sweet corn into cover crops or cover crops into sweet corn um, we did one on we've done some on pumpkin planting um, we did one with Keith Johnson recently about harvesting cover crops as a forage right so alternate uses for cover crops um, and issues around cover crops that uh, we hear about around the state we get in contact with some experts and we, we do a podcast about it um, so Stephanie that is what I have um, there, there is a questions? question oh that's what I was gonna say there was a question that got put in the chat box um, if someone is wanting to graze cover crops do you are there any suggestions as far as what to put out if that's their focus yes so there is a lot of interest in grazing cover crops um, especially as times get tighter right um, the more revenue streams you can have running the better off you are in an operation so there's a lot of interest in grazing cover crops um, and um, there are a lot of our cover crops are actually spun out of the forage world so um, often I talk about if you are looking to graze a cover crop you can get a forage type cover crop so that is going to be your best place if you want to do like uh, if you've got a window like a forage oat right oats are forage oats are really high in protein they're quick growers um, you can graze those pretty quickly um, and even as a cover crop often we'll recommend uh, even with a forage planting we'll recommend planting oats as a, as a nurse crop to get even that forage crop up and running if you want to up the protein in that grazable mix a little higher you can start adding some legumes in course legumes are not as fast growing so you have to 
allow for that. You have to give that some more time. Um, in a corn and soybean rotation, it, is, it can be very difficult to also graze that cover crop. Generally, you've got a, a relatively late harvest window, a short growing season in the fall for that cover crop. There's not a lot there to grow over winter. Um, our fields tend to be wet over winter, so you don't want a lot of traffic out there unless you get a good hard freeze. In the spring, if it's warm enough and dry enough, um, ideally, in most instances, they're gonna be terminating that cover crop to try to plant corn or soybeans. So, so that feeds into what is the goal of that cover crop do you want to, you know, if you want to be able to graze it, you can design your cover crop to graze it, but you may have to make some allowances in your regular cropping rotation for that. Um, the introduction of, of a small grain like wheat can be a huge opportunity to graze a cover crop. You know, you would harvest that small grain in, in July, plant a summer cover crop, they'll get you know, in an ideal summer with a proper heat and moisture, they'll get 10 feet tall. You get tons and tons of, of dry matter biomass accumulation. You can typically graze those a couple of times um, and then even let them grow and stockpile that forage um, for winter. Uh, so that can be a good way to do that. Um, but again, you know, you just you just have to plan on that. Does that does that get at your question, John? Yeah, that works. Thank you. Yep. And I do have some pictures here that we did from a field day two years ago now. Um, where this was after a small grain, I think it was wheat in this instance, um, where they planted one of these big summer mixes and then strip grazed that into the fall. Um, and this was actually a pretty cool partnership. This was um, this was the farm. There there was a farmer involved, and then the person that owned the cattle was not the farmer, right? So this was a, a cool partnership opportunity. Um, where each of them were able to to work together um, to get a little bit more benefit uh, out of that out of that land for each other, um, and of course there's there's huge benefits uh, soil health wise to proper application of manures and of grazing. Um, you know, if you think of a ruminant an animal as a a, a mixing a, a walking um, pooping mixing you know, biological uh, spreader, right? If you're, if you're talking soil biology, um, the introduction of a, of a ruminant animal can be um, extremely powerful as far as uh, your next level of, of a soil health system. So it's a great question. Thanks, John. there aren't any other questions I, uh, I have a video to show you guys um, this is from Rick Clark um, he actually has a field day coming up and this is an extreme example of, of cover crops um, not what we would recommend for a beginner um, but certainly within the realm of possibilities um, so here you can see that cover crop is probably four or five feet tall um, it is reaching maturity. It is it it is at anthesis, um, and and they're crimping that cover crop. And planting right into it. Um, so this is a roller crimper. This is a huge roller crimper. I think this one's like 60 feet. It's pretty good sized. Um, running in the same direction as the planter, and then you just are able to plant right into that. That Sirariah will lay down, provide a mat, help to definitely help to prevent erosion, right? If you're talking soil protection, that mat of Sirariah will absolutely protect your soil. 
Um, it will help to fight weeds. It will keep the sunlight from hitting that soil and, and keeping weeds from germinate. Um, soybeans, of course, fix their own nitrogen, so they are able, in most cases, to handle better that high carbon cover crop and that mat of residue. Um, you wouldn't necessarily want to plant corn into that. that. That might be a really quick way to end up with a train wreck on your hands. Um, but that, that, that is things people are playing with. I don't, I don't mean to say you can't, um, but that's not necessarily where we would recommend um, folks start. So, um, so thank you guys for your attention. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, and uh, please feel free to, to check our website, ccsin.org. Um, my contact information is on there, and uh, everybody have a great night. Hey, Joe, there was another question that came in. Um, since water hemp has been so bad this year, have you noticed any difference between no-till fields um, and fields that had cover crops compared to conventional tillage? I have not specifically um, but Austin, if you've got some fields to look at this, I would be more than interested in, in coming out and checking that out. Um, water hemp is not a mycorrhizal plant. So, um, our, the pigweeds do not form mycorrhizal associations, um, with, with, you know, mycorrhizal fungi. Um, in general, in my experience, um, the, the farther you are into a no-till system, the more cover crops that are used, um, particularly where you limit phosphorus, um, those non-mycorrhizal plants are not as able to compete as um, plants that form mycorrhizal associations. Um, so often it will seem like there are less of your pigweeds in heavy cover crop systems, um, but certainly there are absolutely exceptions to that, um, especially where manure is used. That seems to be one that, you know, there's a lot of available phosphorus in manure, and, and that seems to be one where, where those um, pigweeds are, are really able to compete. So, um, so you know, like with, like with any science, it, it just depends. Well, if there are no more questions, I will go ahead and share my screen with you all. If I can find the right. I see on the participant list a Bill's iPad. Would that be Bill Taylor? Yes, it is. Bill, I do not have a credit number for you. Are you wanting uh, category credits for this or CCA credits? What, uh, what were you after this evening? Losing. I muted again. Go ahead. No. Oh. Do you were you wanting category credits for this evening or CCH uh, CCA yeah. credits? What were you after? No, no, I'm not really after any credits. I just wanted to listen in. Okay, okay. Well, it said yes on the screen or on the registration, so I just wanted to make sure you got what you needed. So no problem. Thank you. Thank you.
And then if you did join in late, I noticed a couple people hopped on um, when we had started. Just make sure you type your name in the chat box down in the corner. Um, that way we got you on here as you were here and listening. Is there anybody that is a certified crop advisor that needs to have their name added to the manual list uh, because they can't, they don't have the app to scan the QR code? There is, I'd be happy to take those now. I am all set, thank you, very good meeting. Awesome, thanks everyone. All right, does everyone have what they need off of the screen? I don't wanna cut it short if people are still getting stuff off of here. Okay, well, I thank everyone and I thank Joe for presenting tonight. Uh, I think that was very insightful and the live demos went very well um, for being on video. So thanks for putting that together for us. And we will catch you all on Thursday evening um, if you're coming back to get more credits and we will see you then.